Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about inclined planes. And uh, when we're talking about an inclined plane, we can be talking about a, um, a ramp, okay? And um, to start off, I've given you a question here where um, we've got this inclined plane and I have this uh, box. Uh, I called this M. Okay, so it's some kind of mass or some box here. And let's imagine that the box is uh, stationary. So let's imagine that this box is stationary at this moment. Um, on this incline. What I want you to do is sketch this down in your notebook as you're watching this video and draw a force diagram for the box. But I'm going to ask you to draw that force diagram right on the sketch that you create. So please press pause on your video and draw that force diagram now. Okay. So if I try and draw a force diagram for this box here, I'm going to start with a dot right there, and so my system is the box. I know that I'm going to have the weight force straight down here perpendicular to the ground, uh, and this is going to be the force of Earth on the object. The next thing I want to think about is what is the normal force here? So what is the force that the ramp itself exerts on the box? And it's always important here to think about where these two surfaces meet. So if we look at where the box meets the incline, we know that our normal force is going to be perpendicular to where those two surfaces meet. So our normal force is going to be here. A lot of people think that that normal force and the weight force have to be in the same direction, but this is a case where um, that's definitely not true. Okay. Now our frictional force is going to be a force that is parallel to where the two surfaces meet. So I'm going to have my friction force here. Label that this way. And that's it here. That's our force diagram. Now, my next question would be, if you could assign a coordinate grid to this particular problem, so if you could make a decision about where your y-axis will go and where your x-axis will go, where would you put it? So what I've done is um, I just drew in this exact uh, problem that we already have. And what I've done is I've just named this angle of the incline theta. So this angle right here, I've named it some unknown angle theta here. Now we have two options here for how we put our y-axis and our x-axis. We can think about putting our y-axis aligned with our normal force right here. So there's our y-axis. And that would make our x-axis must be perpendicular to that. So our x-axis could be here. Another option is to have your y-axis align with mg. So it looks more like, a, I guess, a traditional axis. And then your x-axis has to be perpendicular to mg. Now, neither of these are uh, necessarily correct or incorrect, but one of these two choices is more efficient, okay, or more convenient for us. Which one of those do you think that is? Well, if we look at option one, the normal force ends up directly on our y-axis, and the frictional force ends up directly on our x-axis. So that means we'd have just one force to resolve. The second option, mg is directly on your y-axis, but you'd have to resolve your frictional force and your normal force. So that's why we say that option one is more convenient, okay, or more efficient, because you only have to do the work of resolving one force. So although this is a possibility, 
this is not one that I would suggest on use. Uh, I would suggest that you use. I would suggest that you use option one here because the work will be a little bit simpler in order to resolve just mg. Okay, so let's get to this uh, tough work here of actually trying to resolve mg and kind of seeing what's going on. Um, what we already know is we have our normal force. We have our normal force aligned on the y-axis, so. And our frictional force was aligned right on the x-axis. And this left us with mg here. So mg is the force that we need to resolve. Now looking back on our original sketch here, when we take a look at, I'm sorry, that's kind of like looking like it's at an angle here. When we take a look at the force of Earth on the crate, this mg here, it's important to notice that if your x-axis is where it is, so if your x-axis is here, along, you know, parallel to the incline, and your y-axis is here, the rules that we currently know for how to resolve forces at an angle, those rules are the following. We know that the x component is usually equal to f times the cosine of the angle, and that our y component is usually equal to f times the sine of theta. And this is true when theta equals the angle between f, the vector you're trying to resolve, and the x-axis. The problem that we're given today is a little bit trickier because notice that this theta, this angle that you're given, is not the angle between mg and your x-axis. So here's the angle between mg and my x-axis, and here's theta, and they're not the same. So I guess the next question is, what is this angle? Or how can we represent this angle, the angle between the x-axis and mg? Well, if this is theta, and this is a 90-degree angle, then the angle between our x-axis and mg can be represented by 90 minus theta. Okay, so that means that if I want to resolve mg, so uh, to do that, I'm just going to start with, I've got normal where it is, I don't need to worry about it. I've got friction where it is, don't need to worry about that. But to think about actually resolving mg, I can think about the x component as f cosine of the angle between the x-axis and mg, which in this case is not the angle that's given. So I can think of the x component of mg as being mg times the cosine of 90 minus theta. And I can think about my y component as being mg times the sine of 90 minus theta. And a lot of people at this point kind of stop me when we're in class going over this and say, well, wait a minute, uh, Mrs. Carroll, just hang on. We know that the cosine of 90 minus theta for any angle theta is actually just equal to the sine of theta. We also know that the sine of 90 minus theta is just equal to the cosine of the same angle. So if you know these trig identities, then you know that you could also represent the x component of mg a little simpler. You can represent that as mg sine of theta, where theta is the angle of the incline, and your y component would be then mg cosine of theta, where theta is the angle of the incline. And I knew that that box was stationary, so I know that um, 
the normal force vector should be the same size as the y component and the x vector should be the same size as the frictional force here. Okay, so <clears throat> over here I have the rules for when theta is the angle between f and the x-axis, but would I be able to write a rule for when theta is the angle of the incline? Yeah, I think we can write a rule for that. When theta is the angle of the incline, then the x component of mg equals mg sine theta, and the y component of mg equals mg cosine theta. And I know that this can be confusing when you're so used to um, being able to break up vectors into x and y components when theta is the angle between f and the x-axis. And this is still true when theta is the angle between f and the x-axis. But so often in problems that involve incline planes, what you're given is the angle of the incline. And so I just want you to be familiar with the idea that you can take mg and break it down into its components even if you don't know the angle between mg and the x-axis. And one of the, I guess, major concerns when it comes to AP physics is that many times this um, angle of the incline is not given as a number. Because I know that if it were given as a number, like for example, if theta were given um, as 30, you would very easily be able to know what the angle between the x-axis and mg was. It would be 60. But sometimes this is just given as a variable, and we're asked to maneuver these problems in terms of all variables and constants. So that's why this lesson is pretty important, so that now you know that when you're given the angle of the incline only, that you're still able to deal with that mg vector and break it down into its x and y components. I hope that you found this helpful to get started with some work on inclined planes. There are videos that, uh, that follow this one that are quantitative problem-solving examples. So please feel free to check those out, and I hope that you have a great day.